We are going to move into a further area of our redemption, what Christ has provided us. If you remember last Sunday morning, we saw that God has offered us full redemption. And how he's promised in his word there will be a group of saints at the end of the age of whom the scriptures speak of as overcomers who will rise up, claim, and inherit their full redemption. Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 go together. I don't know why really they're divided up. As someone once said, whoever divided the Bible up into chapters, you see the, the Bible writers did not write in chapters. These are letters and books, prophecies. And whoever divided them up, someone said, must have been riding on horseback. And every time the horse would go up and come down, wherever his pencil hit on a page, that's where you divide the chapter. And we can go through the Bible and prove that must be true because uh, divisions come in the poorest of places. Uh, like chapter 1, since I'm off on it, ends with verse 14, but it, the same thought continues through the first three or four verses of chapter 2 about the angels and ministering spirits. So chapters 3 and 4 go together. You see, God said if we abide, abide in his word, and his word abides in us, and we can have what we will. Well, that's why he's given us the word, why he sent Christ to the cross to provide us with this word. In the book of Hebrews is God's call to us to come out of the shadows and begin to walk in the light. And that's a theme that recurs over and over in this, um, this word of God to us, his people. That the Old Testament, with all of its promises, and many of them glorious, healing and health and protection and deliverance and prosperity, and so on, that all of those promises were but shadows of better things to come. They had a redemption, but not a full redemption, a redemption promise. But we, upon whom the ends of age have come, have a full redemption promise. Now, I mean that the way we said it last Sunday, and I'm not going to repeat that, that... Uh, it's a fullness that some of us can enter into by faith right now. In chapters 3 and 4, he moves in now to another, another great promise available to us of a rest for the believer. We spoke or sang this morning about peace, the peace of God, but that's just another way to say the rest of God, to rest in him. And you will notice here in chapters 3 and 4 that what God is offering you is a rest better than he gave to Israel when he gave them rest from their enemies in the promised land. All right, chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as Moses was faithful to all his house, in all his house. For this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he has built the house, he that hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And so what he sets forth here is what I told you the first Sunday as we entered into this uh, area of teaching that the whole book of Hebrews is stressing, God is encouraging us with the idea that we have things better offered us. We have a better covenant based on better promises. And here again, as I pointed out in that first message, he's comparing Moses, who was the great leader of the old house of Israel, how that we have a better leader in Jesus Christ who made the house. Amen. Not only was Moses a servant over the house God built, uh, not only was he over the house that God built, but he was just a servant over that house. But we have a better priest, a better priesthood, a better high priest, a better leader in Jesus Christ. A better covenant based on better promises. Now on the basis of what we've said thus far, I want you to heed carefully what is repeated two or three times in these two chapters, starting in verse 7. That when God gives us this revelation that he's given us, 
we had better heed it when we hear it while we have an opportunity. Now he's talking to the church. This wasn't written to the world out there. Therefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, and this is today, friends. Today is today. He's talking to you today. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. If you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That's in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. When your fathers, <clears throat> the Israelites, tempted me, literally when they, when they tried me, when they proved me, literally when they provoked me, uh, you know how they murmured and complained, when they saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. And what he's offering us is a rest in him that doesn't pertain to the afterlife but for here and now Amen. Well, certainly we're going to have that rest in the afterlife but here is a type of rest offered Israel which she couldn't get because of her unbelief and God is saying that he's offering us something better a better rest a better peace that we too will fail to receive if we do not heed his voice when we hear it and harden our hearts, then we'll not enter into his rest any more than Israel did. So take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Not all, only two didn't. Joshua and Caleb were the only two Israelites who entered the promised land out of the over three million that left Egypt. Only two. Now, why do you think God puts this in Scripture? You know, we can just assume, well, we're charismatic or we're Christian or both. And uh, I've done all that's sufficient and required. And uh, uh, I'm going to enter into all of these promises and this great rest. Well, God says to be careful. Lest that <clears throat> what you're hearing week after week here, because it doesn't conform to what you've been taught or what you've heard in your Baptist Presbyterian denomination that, like the message last week of full redemption, that that's just his idea or it's beyond uh, anything that's conceivable that could possibly happen. And uh, the look showed on several of your faces last Sunday morning when I even mentioned full redemption, that there would be a group of saints who would not even die. And <clears throat> you could tell by the way people looked that they didn't know that that is based upon sure promises right in the Word of God. And, but, and those who could stick it out through the message found out that it's what they'd already been taught in Sunday school, but they'd never been taught to have any expectation that they would ever be one, anyone or the ones who would enter into it. Well, verse 17, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You know that rest from their enemies, from their labor and slavery in Egypt, that physical rest that they were looking forward to and hoping for, they never got to enjoy because of unbelief. And he isn't just writing that to give us an account of history. The next verse, which we have as chapter 4, let us, there, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being less left us of entering into his rest, that any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Why it requires faith. The whole stress here is faith in what he says. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, 
if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. He's saying here that even though God provided a rest, the seventh day after he finished creation, he rested as a type of the rest he was going to give his people. He said, even though the works have been finished from the foundation of the world, and I've been resting, God says, he said they couldn't enter in because of unbelief, even though it's been available for centuries. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, that God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, he's just quoting passages from the Old Testament, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. And again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, this is Psalm 95, he quotes, Today, after so long a time, it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus should be Joshua, because Jesus is the Greek form of the Old Testament name, Joshua, for if Joshua had given them rest, then, they, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore, of another day, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Whatever the rest is, we can cease from all of this working at trying to get the kingdom established and get people saved and get this or that done. What God is offering you, dear friends, is a rest in him. Let us, therefore, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Not you, the word. Oh, how people labor to, to, to try to get somebody on their knees and get a confession out of them. It's the word that will do it. If you know how to rest in the Holy Spirit, he'll use you as an instrument to get this sword into their hearts because the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divi dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto his eyes, unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. That's what we said the first, first Sunday on these messages. Or maybe it was the second Sunday chapter 2, how that he has been made like unto his brethren, been tempted in every point like us. He knows what you're going through when you ask him for help. And he can comfort you for that reason. You read chapter 2 again, it tells you that. Let us therefore, on the basis of the fact we have a high priest that we can, who can feel with us, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. 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 There is a rest promised to the people of God that they can enter into now by faith. It doesn't pertain to the afterlife. Everyone knows you're going to rest over there on the other side when the millennial stage comes and then the eternal state after that begins. Certainly that's a rest. But God offered Israel a rest here and now. Amen. And she failed to receive it because of unbelief. God is offering us a rest, a better rest than hers, because that's why he inspired the writing in the book of Hebrews, because everything in the book is telling you he's offering us full redemption, a full inheritance that we can enter into now by faith. Begin to at least. Not just healing, but health. Not just basic needs met, but he says, all things are yours. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And that how that the one who made this will, a will is not valid. Even the book of Hebrews says that until the man who made the will dies, 
But the book is written to show us that the one who made us this will and has left us everything has already died. So it's in effect right now, he says. Yea, he has risen again to make it doubly effective. And so <clears throat> many limit what he's talking about here in chapters 3 and 4 simply to the rest that God offered Israel, a physical rest from her enemies and from our slavery in Egypt. But, but look here at uh, certain verses here. He shows you he's not limiting at all the message to their rest. He says in verse 1 of chapter 4, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being less left us of entering into his rest, that any of you should seem to come short of it. He's talking to us. There's a rest for us that we can miss if we're not careful. In verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into this rest, whatever it is. You can enter into it. And uh, in verse 6, Seeing therefore that there remains some to enter in. Not all have entered in yet. That it remaineth that some must enter therein. Because they to whom it was first preached didn't enter in. And he says in verse 7, That why would David be talking about a rest that the people of God can enter into if the rest that Joshua gave them fulfilled what God meant when he said, I'm offering you a promise of rest, my people rest. He says if Joshua had given them this rest, then, then David, verse 8, would, have not, would not afterward have spoken of another day of rest. For he, <clears throat> for verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Well, hallelujah, there's still a rest to enter into that you don't have to labor uh, after you enter into that rest to uh, function as God intends. God gave me a prophecy concerning this, which uh, rather than try to just generalize about, I'll, I'll read us the essential part of what he said. There is a rest which I promise my people that doesn't pertain to the afterlife but to here and now. This is a spiritual rest for the heart and spirit and is to be appropriated by faith. Now, I was prophesying this. I just happened to write it down. One cannot enter into this rest if he remaineth in unbelief concerning my promise to the church regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is a rest promised by me through the prophet Isaiah which I intended my people to enter into and this rest began at the day of Pentecost. From that time until today, my rest has been available, saith the Lord, but my people have failed to enjoy it because of unbelief. Oh yes, most of you have entered into that aspect of his rest, but look at Christendom, the world at large. I mean the church in the world at large has not entered into this rest because of unbelief. And he says there's a promise over in Isaiah about this rest. Over in chapter 28 of Isaiah, God said, I have given my people, offered my people a rest. What is the nature of the rest? Isaiah 28, verses 11 and 12. Here it is. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Does that sound familiar? Wonder what he's talking about. Stammering lips and another tongue. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith Ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Amen. And yet for all that, they will not hear. Now you say, well, now how do you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues out of that? Well, if that isn't plain enough, 1 Corinthians 14 makes it doubly plain because Paul quotes that passage from Isaiah in 1 Corinthians 14 and verses 21 and 22. And he says, in the law it is written... He's quoting Isaiah because the whole Old Testament is the law to a Jew. It is, it is, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign to them, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. And so, as you know anyway, the whole 14th chapter is dealing with speaking in tongues and prophesying. And so Paul says that Isaiah is talking about tongues being assigned to unbelievers and that we prophesy to believers. But we speak in tongues, our tongues would be assigned to an unbeliever. And so this is the rest that God has promised his people. And it is a rest in the spirit. 
I recognize because I have to deal with so many people who, although they have been baptized in the Spirit and uh, do speak in tongues, or at least they've had the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, have not really entered into their rest in the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've had the baptism just a short time, that's no uh, criticism of you, but if you've had the baptism over a year or a year or more and you haven't entered into your rest, you've failed to see the purpose for which he's given you this rest. I remember reading in, in uh, John Stiles' book, Stiles' book, I don't remember his first name, it's John Stiles, his book on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had prayed for thousands of people to receive the <clears throat> baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he tells in there a remarkable incident of how God gave him a vision one time to confirm to him that a person who only gets one word in new tongues has the baptism as much as Peter did on the day of Pentecost when they thought he was drunken on new wine. Not that God wants it that way, but the point is, uh, for obvious reasons, the church today is so bound by its uh, unbelief and wrong teaching, subconsciously if not consciously bound, that often they get just a word or two or three and you, you're supposed to encourage them. Uh, that they have it and that it will increase as they use their faith. <clears throat> well, he tells of praying for a woman. He'd prayed for thousands of people who got one word, and it was a simple little thing that didn't sound like a thing to him since it was natural in language he didn't know. And he said to himself, well, she doesn't have anything. And he just kind of passed it off. And she just kept right on speaking that little word on her knees, praying, you know, and whatever it was, some little old, uh, one or two syllable word. <clears throat> Put, putting along with that didn't sound like a thing to him. And God <clears throat> admonished him. He said, uh, I immediately, in thinking that, God gave me a vision. I immediately saw this woman on her knees praying to God with that one word, in a, speaking it supernaturally in the Spirit. But he said, I didn't think she, that was the baptism. And he said, as she continued to speak it, he saw a little plant begin to break forth through the soil. And every time she'd say that word, it would grow a little, about an inch. And if she'd keep speaking, it'd keep growing. And then God gave her another word, and a leaf came out on the plant. <clears throat> then another word, and another leaf came out. And it grew and grew and grew into a great tree, which gave her shade. And God said, now this is the rest of promise my people. Spoke to him audibly and said, isn't this a beautiful picture of the rest that I promised in Isaiah to my people? There she is now. You know, released from all her cares and tensions, on her knees in the shade of this tree, worshiping and praising me in new tongues. Well, hallelujah, I'll tell you. Uh, I don't know how people, <clears throat> without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, can, can get around the fact that something has happened to those of us who do have it. Uh, there is a joy, a peace, a rest, and they detect it because they tell us many times that they do. They detect it. How that they can, can keep from, from finding out what it is that we've got so they can have it. It's this rest that God is talking about. And yet many people, when they see this, uh, turn away from it. Even though the scriptures are plain that in latter days God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Now for the sake of those of you here who have the baptism, he isn't limiting this rest just to the baptism. This message in Hebrews 3 and 4. But... We too, you see, we must, we must press on and go on beyond Pentecost in our faith and our experience. Our, we'll not enter into that rest that he offers us. There's, there is a rest you enter into when you're baptized in the Spirit, but if you don't pray daily in the Spirit, and if you don't go on and grow in the Word and in faith, then you will never enjoy the rest that he's offered you. Amen. It just doesn't work automatically. But so many who do not have the Holy Spirit some even who are teaching that God is yet one day to pour out his spirit. Yet when they see it, they're turning away from it. Uh, they fail to recognize it. Like in the days of Jesus when the Jews uh, would challenge him uh, for a sign or some evidence that he was who he claimed himself to be. And what he said to them is so revealing of the church today. He said, you search the scriptures for in them. You think you have eternal life. Well, he said, they are they which testify of me. In other words, you're reading them every day, searching them, waiting for Messiah, and here he is. You can't even see him. And I know of people, I have had a friend who uh, was teaching that Joel too was yet to be fulfilled. And yet when he saw it, he backed off from it and said, this isn't it. 
So many are missing what God is doing today in the church. They're failing to enter into their rest. Well, basically for three reasons, and the same three reasons that the Jews miss Jesus. It's because it doesn't conform to their theology. It's because it isn't within the established ecclesiastical system, you know, like a barn and not a cathedral, because uh, there's a cost that always goes with God's free gifts. That's no contradiction. No contradiction at all. His gifts are free, but they're not cheap. And there's something you've got to decide if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's between blessing or favor with men. You can't have both. <laughs> I'm speaking of the established religious system. If you want the blessing, you're going to have to be, wi be willing to give up the favor that the system can give you. And these are the same three reasons they miss Jesus. This is why they're missing the rest that God has provided for his church today for the same three reasons. It doesn't conform, first of all, to their theology. You see, the Jews missed Jesus because they, well, they were looking for a Messiah, but they were looking for a king who would come and reign and rule and sit upon a, a throne, a political throne, and destroy their enemies. And the scripture said, before he comes, Elijah will come and prepare the way before him, and that he would be born in Bethlehem. And when Jesus came, a carpenter, teaching repentance, didn't offer himself as a king. They missed him because, you see, it didn't conform to what they had already preconceived would be the manifestation of the Son of God and the Messiah. Had they bothered to look, they would have discovered he was the Messiah. It was not that he didn't conform to Scripture. He didn't conform to their ideas because when Nicodemus said, to the Pharisees. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and he said when they were criticizing Jesus once after a great miracle, he says, does our law judge any man before it hears him? And they said, are you also one of his disciples, Nicodemus? They said, go search the scriptures, for no prophet arises in, Gal in Nazareth and comes out of Galilee. No prophet comes out of Galilee. And they were exactly right. But you see, because they said Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem, and that's exactly right. But if they'd bothered to ch uh, check, they would have found Jesus had been born in Bethlehem, taken to Egypt, and then came back to Nazareth. And Jesus himself said, if you can receive it, John the Baptist is Elijah. He came to prepare the way for me. Now, he didn't say he was Elijah. He just said he could have fulfilled that role because he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. No, he wasn't Elijah because he himself said he wasn't. They asked John, are you Elijah? He said, no said, I'm the prophet of Isaiah, not the prophet of Malachi. Malachi predicts the coming of Elijah, but they missed him because he didn't conform to their theology, and so it is today. They're just, the denominations are missing what God is doing, for the most part, because it doesn't conform to their theology. And, uh, and some are actually teaching, Joel too, will, actually, will happen one day, but they say it's going to happen to Israel. This baptism is for Israel. And... Uh, just before the millennium, that they're going to be baptized in the Spirit, the Israelites, and speak in new tongues as evidence, you know, that they've been restored as God's people. Now, this is the position that the brethren hold. I taught in their seminary, and uh, this is what I believed for years and taught. And uh, after I became charismatic, I saw how foolish it was because I wasn't a Jew with a name like Freeman and a nose like that. I'm not a Jew. <laughs> and I had entered into it. I saw, well, now, wait a minute, at least one other besides the Israelite is going to receive this experience. <clears throat> and it's not the future, but it's now. Freeman and the nose means English, if you didn't catch it. And so, uh, and I was praying after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the brethren, praying that God would open their eyes or deliver them from their traditions and their unbelief about uh, the miraculous and the supernatural. You see, we, we are not uh, antagonistic toward them, though they claim that we are, and, and they are toward us, but we've already claimed God's blessing upon the college and the seminary and the whole Brethren Church, and uh, uh, we believe that uh, God will do that, and he's already doing it to some extent. And as I was praying one time, immediately I was in the Spirit and had a vision, and I saw in a closet two garments, two suits of clothes. I saw a hand, the closet was dark, trying to get the, the clothes out. And, they, and I heard a voice saying, uh, I don't know what's holding them, I can't get them loose. And then God showed me in the Spirit what it was. The garments were in a garment bag. 
And all you could see was the hanger, you see, at first, and so it looked like nothing was binding them, but they were in a garment bag, and that's why they wouldn't come out of the closet. And so God said to me, as I'd been praying that God would open their eyes and bless them, he said, that's their condition, that the bag, the garment bag, represents their tradition and their, their unbelief and the teaching of men concerning this. And uh, they'll never be able to be useful and perform their function until they're willing to get out of that which binds them. So this is not only true of them, but all the denominations. That uh, You see, what's happening isn't conforming to their theology. They don't deny the Holy Spirit one day will be poured out, but see, it's being poured out today in conformity to what God said and not what they're teaching, and therefore they're missing it. And so God showed me that... Uh, that there is something binding them, and it's their tradition and teaching, and that we should continue to pray for them. And another reason why they're missing it is why they miss Jesus, is because it isn't within the confines of the established religious system. You see, uh, the present worldwide outpouring of the Holy Spirit is, is outside the confines of the denominational institutional system. And uh, the reason for this is that God has never been able to do a work within the confines of established religion. The work that's being done today is among laymen and full gospel businessmen and you have uh, prayer groups and homes and house churches and this sort of thing. Over in Joel chapter 2, God says that when he pours out his spirit, when he offers the church this rest, that he's going to pour out his spirit upon your sons and your daughters and they will prophesy, not the priesthood, not the prophets, but the sons and the daughters and young men will have visions and old men dream dreams. And he says, I'm even going to pour my spirit out upon the most menial uh, of, of uh, persons in the earth upon servants and handmaids, he says. In those days, of course, that would imply slaves and those who were working without pay. They were just serving out some form of servitude. He said, I'm going to baptize them in the spirit. And they are going to prophesy. And they're going to have visions. You see, what God is doing today ha is outside the established system. He didn't say that he was going to establish another ecclesiastical class or just uh, put his spirit upon the prophets or give the scribes and the Pharisees the light and that sort of thing. The apostles, you see, were not educated men. And Jesus was from a poor family. Well, his own mother couldn't offer the usual offering. had to offer just the, the two turtle doves at his birth. And uh, uh, the apostles were meeting the early church in a room, in a house. They weren't down at the temple holding a big worship service when they were baptized in the Spirit. And so this move of God today is still outside, or as it has always been outside the confines of established religion, because God has never been able to break through uh, and do a spiritual work in the ecclesiastical system of man because if it doesn't conform to what they've already established as correct practice and doctrine, they'll have nothing to do with it. If you don't believe that, try it. Of course you believe it because you've been through it. But Israel rejected the prophets. The leaders rejected Jesus. The church today is rejecting this move of the Spirit of God. God isn't doing this in the church. He's doing it in spite of the church. He's doing it outside the church. This great move of the Spirit in this end time didn't come to the church. It came to laymen. That's how I got it. That's the, in fact, that's the only way I could have gotten it because I already knew that I had what I got later. <laughs> you just have to face it, friends, that is, and you wouldn't find anyone any more sincere than I was, but I was sincerely wrong. And you just, uh, and that, that is good up to a point to be sincere and to be unchanging and inflexible about what, uh, God has to say, but sometimes, and without the Holy Spirit, sometimes you're defending uh, your tradition, our Baptist teaching, our Presbyterian doctrine. And that's why God is moving outside the established system. He doesn't, well, you see, the church would institutionalize this move of God. First thing you know, it'd be a Baptist revival and a, and a Presbyterian outpouring, an Episcopalian movement. And uh, God just isn't going to allow it to be bound by the confines of established religion. So that's why he says when it happens, it's going to happen to sons and daughters and servants and maidservants and uh, not just to establish professionals. 
Well, I want to finish that thought that it's good for a person not to be, uh, not to be constantly changing his ideas like a lot of people are. They're just blown about by every wind of doctrine. But you see, that also has its, its negative side, that if you are so dogmatic that you can't change at all, then God can't change you. And if you ever tell God to give you all the truth and all the light, then watch out, because he's going to do it. That's the way I used to pray. I used to say, if there's any other truth, and I didn't mean by that I had it all, but if anyone else is closer to the truth than the way we're following in our church, Lord, show us. And he did. <laughs> And it was outside the confines of our church, too. <clears throat> and, and another reason why that they miss Jesus and they're missing what God's doing today is because, as I said before, you've got to choose between a cross or acceptance with men. Jesus' message was despised. And that's why many could not handle it. You were put out of the synagogue to be a worshiper of Jesus. And today, well, to say the least, speaking in tongues is despised. Now, of course, the baptism, the miraculous, supernatural, the whole charismatic experience is despised, but mainly the thrust of objection is to speaking in tongues. But if you want the power, if you want the anointing, if you want the victory, if you want to be used by God, then don't go around insisting that you can have the baptism or that you've got it without the evidence speaking in new tongues because if for no other reason God has allowed the evidence of the baptism to be speaking in tongues because there's where you're going to have to yield the totality of self. Amen. Which the tongue is the least member, James says, in the body, but he says, oh, he says, how, it's, how it controls the whole body, the whole course of nature, and that if we can tame the tongue, we can tame the man. And so at that point, at least, when we are worshiping God in new tongues, the entire personality, the whole being of man is yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I can see among the reasons I give in my book why I speak in tongues, I can see why God allowed speaking in tongues because of the stigma often at uh, attached to it. You see, the cross is a stumbling block to many people. The cross is a stumbling block, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a stumbling block. And so the speaking in tongues is even a greater hindrance to some people. And God is not going to give his blessings without some willingness on your part to submit yourself to him and to ridicule and to persecution if need be. Oh, I don't mean to suggest today that we're suffering anything like the early Pentecostals did. All oh, read their history, tired and feathered and driven out of town and, and uh, lied about and mistreated and persecuted. Some actually killed just because they spoke in tongues. And so we've got it pretty easy, friends. Just to be laughed at because you meet in a barn is, uh, is not really being a martyr. It's something to, <clears throat> to praise the Lord for. But you have to choose between the two. The rest are having the favor of men. I spoke in a Baptist church several years ago. A friend of mine said, well, I heard something happen to you. I said, yes, I discovered Jesus was alive. And I told him, uh, I knew he was before. I believed he was before. Now I know it because I've been baptized in the Spirit. Well, he said, I heard something happened. Our church is the dead. He said, I prayed, Lord, if something doesn't happen, I'm going to give up the ministry. He said, if there isn't more to Christianity than what I've seen so far, then I have to get out of the ministry because I've got nothing left to preach. And I said, well, brother, that isn't all. There's a whole lot more. But we failed to enter into it because of unbelief. I went down there. Well, he was so hungry, the pastor got the baptism the first, first day, after the first sermon, in his bedroom at home. And several in his church did during that 11-day meeting. Now, what I want to say was, he told me later, I went back, I've been back to that city preaching several times. He said, he said I was quite a well-respected figure in my denomination. The Baptist, you know. And he says, my friend, since I've become charismatic, won't have anything to do with me. And he said, that it was actually reported to me that those who ordained me said, and to think, he said, this was reported to me, they said, and to think, we laid our hands on his head. <laughs> he said, some of my best friends said that, who participated in my ordination. You know, like that, oh, we're contaminated. He's, he's mixed up with those Pentecostals speaking in tongues. Well, I'll tell you, you have to swallow your pride. And, and one brother, a friend of mine and his, used to be our friend until we got, became charismatic, 
He said, he said I don't understand it. He said, you and Freeman were, were those fighting Baptists. And brother, we would defend the faith. <laughs> Baptists didn't need anybody of it but us. And he said, yes. He said, I don't understand. He said, something's happened to you and Freeman. I, he says, uh, I don't know what it is. And he said, well, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He says, but, but you were those fighting Baptists, the most dogmatic Baptists I've ever seen. He said, yes, since I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, I've laid down my guns. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> this same brother, who, this same brother, a very brilliant man with a doctor's degree in theology from the Baptist seminary, good friend of mine, used to be. He actually preached. And the reason that we were friends is because we believed there was something more, something deeper than what you saw in the established church. And he's one of the most brilliant men that you will ever meet. A doctor of theology, and his church was in an old grocery store converted into a church. You see, he was willing to pay that cost, and he could have had the biggest church in, among the Southern Baptists just to be able to teach it like he believes it. And he was teaching and preaching for years that Joel 2 is yet going to be fulfilled. It wasn't fulfilled at Pentecost. That when God pours his spirit out upon all flesh, it's going to be outside the institutional church. He says it won't be in the denominational system at all. And yet, <clears throat> and he preached that for years, several years later, I was right in that city. This pastor was his friend also, and he came to hear me twice. Out of 11 days of preaching and teaching, he came to hear me twice and called for his letter from that church. He was a member of that brother's church who received the baptism. And he said, well, what's wrong? He says, I just can't be mixed up with this Pentecostalism. He says, it would hurt my work. Well, he made his choice. But see, he's been preaching for years. It's going to happen, and when it happened, he didn't recognize it. Why? It didn't conform to what he had already conceived it ought to be. I guess he thought a big cross with neon lights would flash in the sky with his name on it, say, this is it. And it would start raining, a little rain or something, and everybody would start doing the miracles and the works. But he says, it's going to happen. But said, this isn't it. Well, I wonder how he's going to recognize when it happens. If he doesn't recognize the, oh, literally millions who have been baptized in the Spirit since 1900 and the miracles and things that are taking place. And when he heard my testimony, friends, I pulled out all the stoppers. And he just couldn't handle it because uh, the cost was too great. You have to choose between the cross and favor with men. Yes, it would hurt his work. He'd probably lose his job. <clears throat> to enter into his rest, he would probably have to get another job. Oh, I mean, he's in the ministry, but he's a, he's a big leader there in Louisville, Kentucky, you see, and a leader of a, a big movement there. And so uh, he would lose his job. I mean, he's out of that storefront church. He would, did that back during my seminary days. He was pastor of that little storefront church. And he's willing to do that, you see, and be ridiculed, but not willing to accept the tongues. Well, why did Israel fail? Why did Israel fail? Hebrews 3 and 4 says, because we're unbelief. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not something optional. God gives you the option of choosing as a Christian whether you want or not. It's necessary in order to do his work. It's necessary in order for you to be able to stand in these last days. It'll be necessary. Christians will fall over like leaves falling off of a tree uh, when these great persecutions and trials come on the earth. They won't have either the power or the faith to stand. You don't get faith overnight. I guess most of you know that. It, it, it's a growth, it's a fruit that grows. And you'll need the Holy Spirit in order to enter into your rest. You'll never enter into it otherwise. That's why they fail. If you'll turn over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, you'll see that, that Paul, who I believe wrote the book of Hebrews, also gives us the same warning here. That we shouldn't assume just because we say we're saved that we've got it all and we're all right, or even because you have the Holy Spirit that you're automatically uh, safe from any deception or overthrow by the enemy. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, coming out of Egypt, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all did eat of the same spiritual meat, and all did drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. They were actually 
where you are in the Old Testament drinking of Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. And you see who they were tempting in the Old Testament. Not, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Verse 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Well, there it is. I didn't invent it. Paul wrote it. Inspired the Holy Spirit. That they were following Christ too. They were following the pre-incarnate Christ. That angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. That, that God said, I'm going to send my angel and he will lead you. And, and my name will be in him. That was Jesus before his incarnation. And that's what he's saying here. They were following him. Amen. And drinking of him. Well... You can get to a point, dear friends, where you, you're so secure in your own ability to stand and you, that you become careless. He says, let him that think he thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Amen. Oh yes, praise God for verse 13, but remember 12 before you read it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you're able to bear it. He'll make the way of escape, but you've got, to, you've got to make the escape. You've got to resist the temptation. God says in Amos that he sets a plumb line. He set a plumb line <clears throat> uh, in the midst of Israel, and he said, I'm not going to pass by that way anymore. They've gone to the point of no return. He drew a line. He said, here are the redeemed over here and there are the rebellious over there, those who won't heed my word. And he left them there. And God is drawing a plumb line today. That's what Hebrews 3 and 4 is all about, dear friends, that there's danger in delay when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, whether it's for the baptism or deeper life or the message of faith. God constantly through this church uh, trying to get you out of all the... Uh, elements of unbelief that are so, uh, so prevalent in charismatic Christians today as well as the others that some of you who don't think you have any doubt and fear and unbelief need to be purged of it. And that's why God allows you the trials to prove whether or not you're talking words. But there's danger and delay is what Hebrews 3 and 4 state that if it doesn't conform to your theology, what you hear, if it, doesn't, uh, uh, if it isn't within the confines of established religion, if there's a cost attached to it, and certainly the deeper life and mature faith, there's a great cost attached to it. You don't get faith as a gift. We're not talking about the gift of faith. We're talking about the fruit that grows through trial. Uh, if, if you delay because it isn't conforming to, what, uh, to these three things that we mentioned, then there's danger and delay because, because resistance to the truth becomes progressive. That's exactly what you see here in chapter 4 of Hebrews. That after you don't heed what the Holy Ghost says, after you do not heed what the verse uh, chapter 3, I mean, after you do not heed what the Holy Ghost says, then your heart becomes hard toward it. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, the day of temptation in the wilderness. And what, what are people hardening their hearts against? The preacher or the, the message? No, against the Holy Ghost who inspired it. Verse 7, today, if the Holy Ghost says today, if you will hear his voice. See, God is speaking to us by the Holy Spirit. And so if you delay, there's a danger in it because verse 8 says the next step, you'll harden your heart. And what comes after that? You start tempting God and trying God and trying to prove God or to prove if these things that we say are so. And, uh, and that's when God says you've gone to the point of no return and generally he will, 
he will overthrow that individual. They begin to tempt him and challenge his word. And uh, like people who, when they first see this move of the Spirit of God, they can't deny that it is God's work. They can deny it. No way in the world to deny it. But because it doesn't conform to their preconceived ideas, because there's some cost involved in, in uh, appropriating it for themselves, they delay, and then they become hard toward it, and then they start resisting it. They say, oh, I'm just trying to prove it's not of God or something, like people who come to a meeting like this. Well, friends, I can spot them when they walk in the door. I don't talk about them. Amen. Who are here to see what this babbler has to say, as they said of Paul. Who are here to spy out the land, Paul says. Or in here, said, he said, he said uh, some sense spies in to spy out our liberty in Christ. Well, that's what they're doing when they come up here, spying out our liberty in Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah, because... Uh, that shouting and hand clapping and praising the Lord without reservation is, is evidence of our liberty. And I don't mean like it happens all the time and there's a whole row of them sitting back there every service. I'm just saying that they're there more often than you may suspect. That's why I don't look in some directions because I don't want it to kill the anointing. And they say, oh, we're just there to, to, to find out what's going on. But they're not there to find out. They're there to prove it's not of God. I mean, in their own minds, they're already hardened beyond the point of being convinced. Now, that isn't 100% true, but that's, that's what happens when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because it, there's a cost involved with obedience or it doesn't conform to your traditions or theology, you delay, you don't do anything about it, and then that hardening process sets in. Amen. And you end up like, well, I got a call once from a brother that said, uh, wanted to know about the Holy Spirit. And he said, he says, I believe it's genuine. And, uh, but he says that our church, uh, that's supposed to be looking for all the truth, a non-denominational church, uh, have decided this move, the charismatic outpouring is not of God. He said, our leaders have investigated it thoroughly. They've come to the conclusion it's not of God. Well, I talked to him several times about it, and he and his wife had received the Holy Spirit, but they were trying to talk them out of it. And he said, <clears throat> uh, he said, but, and he would present me their evidence, you know, because he was right on the fence. He had no teaching and he had no way really to tell at that stage uh, whether this was of God or not, although he had the experience. Uh, without the teaching, you know, you need to get surrounded with the teaching, with the faith. Uh, it, it's so often it's so little good to get the baptism and then go off on an independent course somewhere. You need to get in a body where that is charismatic. Well, he wasn't surrounded with any faith, say the least. And he said that the leaders who had tried to investigate this uh, from a scriptural standpoint had come to the conclusion that it wasn't of God. He said, uh, now what are you going to do with this? Because uh, uh, he said, here's a case where it seems that they were right. He said they went to this charismatic meeting, uh, named some meeting somewhere they went to where they were holding uh, charismatic services, and he said they went there with the intention of, of showing that the whole thing was a fraud, that speaking in tongues was an interpretation and so forth was not valid and of the devil. See, they'd gotten beyond the point of trying to find out if it's of God. They were going to prove it wasn't. And so the leaders, <clears throat> pastor and another leader in the church, had devised a scheme. He memorized, the pastor remember, memorized the uh, Lord's Prayer in Greek backwards. So he said, I'm going to get up and speak in tongues. That's what they'll think, but I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer in backwards Greek. And then, of course, one of these Pentecostals, and everybody's a Pentecostal to a non-charismatic, some Pentecostal will interpret it, and then we'll, we'll prove. We'll have it right on our tape recorder, and we'll prove, because I'm already saying on the tape what I'm doing, and the interpretation uh, can't interpret that because it isn't anything. Well, he did that. He got up and thus saith the Lord. Oh, no, he spoke in tongues. That's what it was. And went through the Lord's Prayer backwards in Greek. No interpretation. They waited and waited. Well, after some reasonable delay, the pastor got up and prophesied. Now, to them, it was interpretation because they think interpretation, by the way, he said interpretation, they've told me, the leaders of this church, is a translation, the exact words. Well, I said to begin with, they don't know what interpretation is because without the Holy Spirit, how could you know? Interpretation is, is not a translation. It gives a sense or meaning of what was spoken in tongues. 
never a translation. And uh, <clears throat> so the pastor got up and prophesied. Well, now, he didn't know it was in tongues. Like, you could get out there and speak some gibberish unless the Holy Spirit showed me. I wouldn't know you weren't speaking in tongues. You could make up something. And someone stands up and gives what you think is the interpretation. Well, you better listen to what the interpretation was because it was a prophecy. This poor pastor didn't know what was going on, and he didn't even know what he was saying. He was talking directly to them. And this brother read me the prophecy. In fact, I've got a copy of it. He gave it to me later. Well, I said, brother, look at it. I said, that's a direct word to them. I said, listen to how it starts out. I know all your plans and purposes. I know why you're here tonight. And this is your final call to repent. I said, and it went on like this. I said, how much plainer could it be? God was warning them through prophecy that he knew. And you see, if they had been open to the Holy Spirit, they would have been convicted. Because I've had people tell me, like uh, two Arabs in, in Jordan when I was over in Israel said, Said, man, I, they said, we went up to, to disturb a charismatic service in Jerusalem. Said, well, they began, you know, speaking in tongues and prophesying up there, up, up, up there in that room. Said, we fell on our faces. We fell under conviction, fell on our faces and repented because the Holy Spirit just pierced our hearts with a sword uh, as a result of that. And he said, we were saved as a result of the supernatural manifestation of the Spirit. And so that's what Paul says anyway in 1 Corinthians 14, that you can convince unbelievers with tongues and prophecy. But that implies they'll be open to being convinced. Amen. That's right. And you see, the responsibility is on you. That's why three times he says, harden not your heart. Harden not. Well, I'll tell you, dear friends, these, these, these pastors in that church, of course, they've gone beyond the point of no return. It's no longer a point of them trying to prove whether or not this is of God. You can get to the place where you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't be in their shoes for all the gold in the world. Why, they say we're just trying to prove uh, whether or not the prophecy you're speaking in tongues is of God. Well, you can't prove the supernatural uh, by logic and reason. Uh, the miraculous, the supernatural, the speaking in tongues, the prophecy, all is to be received by faith. I always have a little bit of uh, uh, tendency to laugh at these books that are written trying to prove that there are whales big enough that could swallow a man to prove that the book of Jonah is true. As I say in my book, Introduction to the Old Testament Prophets, uh, faith is beyond the realm of reason. Uh, if you prove that there's a whale big enough to swallow a man, maybe somebody could prove that no whale could swallow a man. Then what's that do to your book of Jonah? Amen. Why, well, it'd be very easy for me to prove that uh, uh, whales cannot get as much down as you think, friends. And so uh, to try to prove the miraculous by all of these schemes and so forth and by logic and reasoning is missing the point because you don't appeal to a man's reason. Uh, when God speaks to a man, he speaks to his heart. And to run around with your tape recorders, I've heard people do and record some of these things we say in tongues and the interpretation and then go out and try to find somebody that speaks that language and say, well, no one is able to recognize this. They've run tests on it and all of that. And here's a man who's a linguist and he says it doesn't even have the pattern of a true language and all that is, well, to say the least, that whatever was spoken when a person brings a tape recorder in to a service to try to prove God and tempt him, he would probably allow the most primitive dialect that anybody in the world ever spoke to be spoken that night so they could never trace it. I mean, take a tape recorder around try to prove whether or not it's a language or not. There are only 2,800 languages and dialects. And if you spoke eight or ten, and, and I don't know anybody that does, no one man who speaks eight, and he's a genius. If you spoke eight or ten languages, you've still got 2,800 to go that you would never recognize because a language you don't know to an untrained ear always sounds like gibberish. I've proven it time and time again. I can rattle off in Hebrew or German something and people look at you like, well, there you go speaking in tongues. I wasn't speaking in tongues. It just, you know, but, but like anything that I do speak in tongues will sound like gibberish to an ear that doesn't understand the language. How could it? How could it sound like anything else? But uh, to make a point about it, I think it's Frodsham in his book, Art Smith Wigglesworth, one of them, says that, that back during the early outpouring of Pentecost, they weren't trying to test whether or not this was of God. They were amazed because an uneducated woman in London spoke 75 languages that they could recognize perfectly, and she couldn't even speak English. 
except like someone that had gone to the first or second grade. And that was actually uh, tested. Uh, the linguists and scholars at Cambridge and Oxford in London and England uh, tested her as far as... Uh, she was just an uneducated uh, mock woman and could just rattle off in tongues and they, rec they recognized, oh, she spoke more than that, 75 languages and dialects that she spoke perfectly. Uh, if you're, but they weren't trying to prove it. If you try to prove it, it isn't going to work anyway. I mean, uh, God isn't going to let you prove anything to him uh, Duplicy tells about his father when he was baptized in the Spirit. You see, a language may be very primitive. And what have you proved by because it just sounds like a little bit of a repetition of two or three little syllables to you? What have you proven? Those two or three little syllables may, may mean praise the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That may be all he's saying, but he's saying it over and over. And God is being blessed and glorified by it. It doesn't matter if all the scholars and intellectuals in the world say it's gibberish. And Duplessis said when his father got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of course, he was <coughs> baptized in spirit, spoke many tongues. He says his father, when he began to speak, it sounded like a chicken clucking. <laughs> oh, he said to himself, he doesn't have anything. It, just, it was just cluck, cluck, cluck. That's all it sounded like to him. <laughs> and he says, but his father enjoyed it and just went on for years, clucking like a chicken. <laughs> And he believed he had it, and of course he had the fruits in his life that went with it. When you're baptized in spirit, things begin to change. But Duplicy said, I didn't believe, you know, that he had it. And he said, later as a missionary in Africa, one time he said it was out in the depth, the, the uh, uh, innermost parts of Africa, and I heard these sounds coming from some pygmies. And I said to the interpreter, you know, the fellow who could, the native, I said, what is that? Why well, says they're talking to one another? He says, talking to one another. Why well, says, my father speaks that back in London. <laughs> he said, that's a language. Why well, says, yes, it's their language, quite primitive, but they communicate this way. I mean, after all, pygmies in the darkest of Africa, friends, uh, don't need uh, technological terms like uh, things to do with spacecraft and computers and... <laughs> So you can't judge a thing by this. You don't want to delay or harden your heart. You'll get to the point where you start trying God and testing God all in the name of defending the truth and religion like they're doing. They're at the point where they can never receive. And his wife called me once. The same brother told me about the church that did this. And, and she said, they're in there now, you know, trying to talk my husband out of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the leaders. And she says, I believe I have it, but I'm... On the fence, I don't know. They say it's not of, they, not of God. You say it is. Others say it is. And she said, uh, I've only gotten three words. And said, I've been up walking up and down the hall here speaking those three words. I said, what are they? She said, Abba, Lakasha, Ami. I said, I don't know if that means anything. Well, I said, it certainly does. I said, you're speaking perfect Hebrew. Abba, Lakasha, Ami. I said, you know what you're saying? Because they're in there trying to talk to your husband out of the Holy Spirit, you're saying, Oh, Father, my people are stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Abba, Father, Lakasha, stubborn, Ami, my people. I said, You're speaking perfect Hebrew, and you're, you are pleading and intercessing there, you see, on the behalf of that. <laughs> oh, praise God. Well, he let me recognize it to help her because it could have been any of those other 2,800, and I wouldn't have. <laughs> But you'd be surprised how many times people have spoken Hebrew, and I do recognize it. And it's really, really been a blessing to them because the devil has been trying to convince them it's not of God or something. But you can get to a point where, where your life or your work, uh, even as a professing Christian, will just come to nothing. And as I, when I was up in Dayton, Ohio, a brother told me about a uh, situation there. I was there speaking at a full gospel business meeting. He said, meeting, he said there's a Baptist church here that took your little faith book and um, said instead of preaching the word, he's been every Wednesday tearing this apart, proving it's not scripture. He said, Brother Freeman, now he volunteered all of this. He said from the very night he started that, his church has gone down, 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 down. He says it's not doing a thing now. You can't fight the word of God. This isn't Hobart Freeman, friends. This goes out by the tens of thousands. And you see what it does from the people we meet and the letters we get and the phone calls. And you'll find out 
that uh, you're not fighting a man. And we could say that of other literature. I just happen to know about mine because he told me about it. He said that church went down as nothing. I was speaking in a church uh, some years ago where a brother said there was a Baptist church over here and the pastor had the baptism. The church did real well. And, of course, not everyone was in favor of it. Then when he left, he took another pastor. When he left, they called another pastor. But before they did, they said, uh, you, what do you think about speaking in tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Oh, he said, I don't believe in it. It's not for a day. Well, they called him and said, that church, between the two pastors, just stopped. You know, it went down and down the same way. The same pastor <clears throat> that I was speaking in his church said, we had a man here. Some time ago, we called him uh, to preach a revival, what they call preaching a revival, an evangelistic meeting. And um, he was non-charismatic, but he had a message. You know, you can be anointed the Holy Spirit and not be baptized in the Spirit. Uh, I just might as well say it. Uh, Billy Graham is a good example. He's being used the Lord, anointed by the Spirit, but he isn't baptized in the Spirit. Now, right away, I can see... <laughs> That about 90% of you say, so, oh, surely he is, and all that. Well, we happen to know that he isn't, and by his own admission that he doesn't speak in tongues. We, I have it, I mean, where he said it. Uh, uh, but, uh, and this isn't saying anything to criticize him. I'm just thinking what he could do with it, what he could do with the baptism, because uh, just to make one comparison and do it in love, T.L. Osborne will see more people saved in one sermon than evangelists without the Holy Spirit will see in a whole year. Now, that's just the way it is. It makes a difference. And so, but he had, he had an anointing, and he had a message. And he says he preached and people were getting saved every night. Without the baptism, they were getting saved because they were believing that word. But he said Wednesday, he says they got up and preached against the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, and he said that revival was killed just like that. Now, if I remember correctly, he said there wasn't anybody else saved the rest of that week. And I believe he told me, he said, I told him why. I said, you killed the meeting when you went against the Holy Spirit. You can't fight the Holy Spirit in the name of Christianity or religion and expect to prosper. Uh, it's better off to do as I did. When I didn't know about it, I just said, well, I don't think it's for day and it's not for me. I wasn't fighting it. I wasn't saying it's of the devil. Brother came to our church when we first started this church and went on a lake and he had the baptism and oh my, were we afraid of him because we just thought he's liable to break out in tongues at any time. And, <laughs> and as old dead dry Baptist, you know, you, you don't know what to expect. But when he told me he had the baptism and spoke in tongues and had a vision, you know what I said to him? I said, brother, I couldn't deny your experience. If you've had it, you know it. I said, I just don't believe it's for me or for today. But I said, I couldn't say you don't have it. Now there's a difference in approaching it that way. That's ignorance. <laughs> it is it's educated ignorance but you see Paul said I blasphemed he went even beyond and persecuted the church but he said I obtained mercy because I did it in ignorance when you don't do it in ignorance you see that's the hardening of the heart the resistance of the Holy Spirit you come to a place where you're fighting it openly consciously that you cannot stand to have uh, this uh, in your midst it, it's a point of no return. If you want to know whether or not people have committed the unpardonable sin today, I'll say I believe they have. I think it's a rare thing when they do. Uh, if you want to know, have they blasphemed the Holy Spirit? I believe they have. I think it is, again, the exception. So much of this opposition to the Holy Spirit is in ignorance. It's just ignorance. And you'll see all the time people who come and who are baptized in the Spirit who actually opposed it and spoke against it, but they were doing it in ignorance. But you see, there's a danger of doing that because you never know when you get to the point that the hardening of the arteries sets in. <clears throat> no heart gets too hard for God to reach you. And so today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, saith the Lord. Amen. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Lord, we are grateful today that you have in your mercy and grace seen fit to call us out of our unbelief and ignorance and pour out upon us the spirit of grace and truth and to give us this rest that we can enter into it through prayer in the spirit and through a yielding to the Holy Spirit we now have ceased from our labors and are entering into a rest, a spiritual rest that you have offered the people of God. 
We pray this morning that if there is a single heart here this morning not yet filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Spirit with the evidence of new tongues, that they would not harden the heart further, but would come, respond to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and receive this rest.